Well, good morning. I have called this preliminary hearing in order to consider a motion on behalf of certain core participants um, asking me to request first the Solicitor General for Scotland, to whom the Lord Advocate has delegated her function in respect of dealings with the inquiry, and second, the uh, Chief Constable of Police Scotland to give certain undertakings in respect of any statement or evidence provided to the inquiry uh, by uh, these core participants. The Solicitor General accepts uh, that it is open to her to give such undertakings. In written submissions, Senior counsel for the Chief Constable contended that it was not competent for the Chief Constable to grant such a request. In other words, it was not uh, lawfully within the power of the Chief Constable uh, to grant such a request, even if he were minded uh, to do so. Prior to this hearing, however, uh, she departed from that position and the Chief Constable now accepts that it is competent uh, for him, through the Deputy Chief Constable designated under the Police Service of Scotland Conduct Regulations 2014, uh, to give undertakings of the kind sort. That means that this preliminary hearing allows us to concentrate on addressing the question as to whether I should request the undertakings sought. I propose to proceed as follows. Uh, I shall ask senior counsel to the inquiry to make submissions. I shall then ask Miss McCall, on behalf of Sergeant Scott Maxwell, Constable Daniel Gibson and Constable James McDonoghue, the core participants who made the application to address me. I shall invite Miss Mitchell on behalf of the uh, family of Shekubayo to uh, explain their position. Uh, I shall ask the Dean of Faculty to address me on behalf of the Scottish Police Federation. Uh, and Mr. Jackson on behalf of uh, Constables Cayley Good, Alan Smith, and Ashley Tomlinson. Uh, some other counsel indicated that they might wish to address me, so after I've heard from these uh, counsel, I shall give an opportunity uh, to anyone else to indicate that they wish to address me. And then finally, I'll give an opportunity to senior counsel to the inquiry uh, to make any final submissions. So against that background, uh, Ms. Graham, would you carry on, please? Thank you. Before summarizing the events which have brought us here to this preliminary hearing, I would like to begin by introducing those who are present here today. I am assisted today by my junior, Laura Thompson. Appearing on behalf of relatives and family members of Sheku Bayo are Claire, is Claire Mitchell. Appearing on behalf of the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Scotland are Maria Maguire and Lisa Henderson. Representing the Lord Advocate is Alistair Duncan. On behalf of PERC, the Police and Information Review Commissioner is John Scott. On behalf of the Scottish Police Federation, retired Constable Nicole Short and Constable Craig Walker is the Dean of Faculty, along with his junior Ewan Scott. Representing retired Constable Peyton is Brian McConaughey and Laura Ann Radcliffe. PC Ashley Tomlinson, PC Good and PC Smith are represented by Gordon Jackson and Carla Fraser. Representing Sergeant Scott Maxwell, PC Gibson and PC McDonough are Sheila McCall and her junior David Adams. Representing former Chief Superintendent Gary McEwen and Chief Superintendent Conrad Trickett is Duncan Hamilton. Representing Temporary Assistant Chief Constable Patrick Campbell today is Ian Cahill. 
a solicitor with Levy and McCree. And finally, representing the Commission for Racial Equality and Rights is Mark Moyer. This preliminary hearing has been convened to allow you to hear submissions on whether to seek undertakings from the Lord Advocate and the Chief Constable in order to secure the evidence of those core participants who are serving or former police officers. As you've noted, the Lord Advocate has delegated responsibility for her dealings with the inquiry to the Sol Solicitor General. Responsibility for disciplinary matters is delegated to the Deputy Chief Constable. If you are minded to seek undertakings, your request should be directed to the Solicitor General and the Deputy Chief Constable. The following officers attended Hayfield Road on the 3rd of May 2015 and have core participant status. Sergeant Maxwell, Constables Gibson, McDonough, Walker, Good, Smith, Tomlinson, and Mr. Payton and Miss Short, who are both retired. And the following senior officers who were involved in post-incident management also have core participant status and are represented today. Chief Superintendent Trickett, Temporary Assistant Chief Constable Campbell, and Mr. McEwen, retired Chief Superintendent. Now the background is that on the 11th of November, 2019, the Lord Advocate wrote to the Chief Constable of Police Scotland and the solicitors acting on behalf of the officers who were involved in the restraint of Sheka Bayo. And the letters were in the following terms. They were headed up the death of Sheku Bayo on the 3rd of May 2015 in Kirkcaldy. And they said, and I quote, I write to advise you that Crown Council have instructed that no criminal proceedings will be instituted against any police officer in relation to the death of Sheku Bayo in Kirkcaldy on the 3rd of May 2015. On the basis of the current information available. You will be aware that there is an obligation on the prosecutor to keep cases under review. This includes cases in which the prosecutor has decided to take no action. The Crown therefore reserves the right to prosecute any of the officers at a future date. The Crown's decision to take no proceedings was based on the evidence available in November 2019. The Crown reserved the right to review that decision in the future if further evidence came to light. The Crown reserved the right to prosecute any of the officers at a future date in light of that further evidence. These officers were not granted immunity from prosecution. It should be clear at the outset that none of the officers are seeking immunity from prosecution. There is no application before you seeking immunity from prosecution. And none of the matters discussed today will result in any application seeking immunity for those officers. Since the decision by the Lord Advocate in November 2019, no evidence has been led before any court in relation to the death of Sheku Bayo. Evidence about the circumstances leading to Mr Bayo's death will be heard for the first time at this public hearing in this inquiry, which commences on the 10th of May this year. It is possible that evidence that was not available to the Crown in 2019 will emerge at the hearing and in particular in the evidence given by the police officers. Something said by an officer in evidence might provide new evidence against him or her and or against another officer or officers. The officer's evidence will be taken on oath and will be recorded and transcribed. The transcript of the evidence will be available to all, including the Crown. At the conclusion of the inquiry, the transcript may be used by the Crown 
to consider anew whether there is sufficiency of evidence against any of the officers who played a part in Mr Bale, Bale's restraint or subsequent events, and bring criminal proceedings if there is a sufficiency of evidence and prosecution is in the public interest. The transcript of an officer's evidence would be admissible as evidence against him or her at any future trial. In the circumstances, in giving evidence to this inquiry, the officers have the right to refuse to answer any questions asked of them that may tend to incriminate them. And this is because of the privilege against self-incrimination. Having considered the submissions lodged on behalf of the other core participants, it is clear that the nature and scope of the privilege are not in dispute. My submissions refer to some authorities, but I do not propose to refer to these in any detail in the absence of any dispute and indeed large areas of agreement. My submissions will be made available publicly and will be part of the transcript of this hearing. In relation to the nature of this privilege, it has been said, and I quote, that it is sacred and inviolable principle that no man is bound to incriminate himself. A witness is not obliged to answer any question if the answer would incriminate him in a crime for which he has not been dealt with or granted immunity. The privilege is enshrined in Article 6 of the European Convention on Human <coughs> Rights. The right to remain silent when being questioned by the police and the privilege against self-incrimination have been described as generally recognised international standards which lie at the heart of the notion of a fair trial under Article 6 and which are based upon the assumption that the prosecution proves its case without recourse to methods involving coercion or oppression. The privilege applies equally to a guilty person who wishes to avoid conviction as to an innocent person who wishes to avoid the inconvenience of a prosecution. In relation to the scope of the privilege, the privilege is only engaged where providing information would create or increase the risk of incrimination. The privilege applies not only to a direct question as to whether the witness has committed a specific crime, but to examination on facts which indirectly infer guilt or may form links in a chain of evidence. The privilege extends to evidence which might be used for the purposes of deciding whether to bring proceedings against the person who gives it. The privilege is not absolute. It does not extend to a risk of incrimination in disciplinary proceedings, as they do not expose the witness to a risk of conviction for an offence. The privilege does not apply to the incrimination of others. On that basis, an officer cannot rely on the privilege to refuse to answer questions that may incriminate other officers. In a public inquiry such as this, while Section 21 of the Inquiries Act 2005 empowers you to require the attendance of witnesses for the purpose of giving evidence, the privilege against self-incrimination is expressly preserved by Section 22. As such, and because the officers may be prosecuted in the light, in future, sorry, in light of evidence that emerges at the inquiry, they are entitled to rely on the privilege against self-incrimination. Any questions asked by the inquiry team in preparation for or at the hearing in May about what happened on the 3rd of May 2015 will give rise 
to a risk of incrimination. Questions about events in the aftermath of Mr Bayo's death may also give rise to that risk. The officers involved in Mr Bayo's restraint and the subsequent events would be entitled to exercise the privilege and to answer no comment. This is their right. They cannot fairly be criticised for exercising that right and no adverse inference can be drawn from the exercise of the privilege against self-incrimination. Guilt or blame cannot be inferred from silence. As the Chair of this inquiry, it is not within your power to insist that the officers waive the privilege. Only the officers themselves, having received legal advice, may do so. There have been occasions where witnesses have exercised the privilege against self-incrimination and refused to answer questions at inquiries and inquests. On the 22nd of December 2014, a bin lorry collided with pedestrians in Glasgow city centre, killing six and injuring many others. At the fatal accident inquiry into their deaths, the driver of the lorry, who remained at risk of prosecution, elected not to risk incriminating himself and answered no comment to questions. A reply of no comment would not have prejudiced his position at any subsequent trial, but equally, for the purposes of the inquiry, did not amount to evidence upon which any conclusions or inferences could be drawn by the Sheriff. It also caused public concern and upset to the family of those who died. Similarly, in the Stephen Lawrence inquest in 1997, the five men then suspected of involvement in Stephen's murder refused to answer any questions asked of them. Lord McPherson, in his subsequent report, following the public inquiry into Stephen Lawrence's death, observed that this part of the inquest must have been both frustrating and indeed almost farcical to the jury. We fully understand the coroner's reasons for summoning the five suspects to court and calling them, although the fact is that calling them did in fact achieve nothing. Now, in relation to the events leading up to today's hearing, as was stated at the preliminary hearing on the 18th of November, the inquiry is now at the stage of seeking witness statements and letters have been sent out to witnesses. At that hearing, we invited and encouraged those who received letters to contact the inquiry team to make arrangements so that statements could be taken as soon as possible. And that work is ongoing. Letters were sent to the legal representatives of the police officers who played a part in restraining Mr Bio on the 3rd of May 2015. Those letters were sent on the 29th of November and the 9th of December last year. In response, and having been advised by their respective legal teams, those officers have indicated a willingness to engage with the work of the inquiry and to assist the inquiry. Three of those officers, Constables Gibson, McDonough and Sergeant Maxwell, have however requested that before providing statements or oral evidence to the inquiry, that you seek certain undertakings from first of all the Crown and second of all the Deputy Chief Constable. In the absence of these undertakings, they may exercise the privilege against self-incrimination. And it was their applications that initially came before you today. The undertakings sought from the Solicitor General are to the effect that no evidence given by these officers 
would be used against them in any subsequent criminal proceedings in the future or in deciding whether to bring such proceedings. The undertakings sought from the Deputy Chief Constable are to the effect that no evidence given by those officers would be used against them in any misconduct proceedings in the future or in deciding whether to bring such proceedings. The other core participant officers and former officers reserve their position at this stage, but all have indicated that undertakings from the Solicitor General may be necessary. Of the 12 core participant officers and former officers, a total of eight have indicated that they may also require an undertaking from the Deputy Chief Constable. In addition to Constables Gibson, McDonough and Sergeant Maxwell, they are Constables Good, Smith, Tomlinson and Chief Superintendent Trickett and Temporary Assistant Chief Constable Campbell. Now, with regard to the test which should be applied in considering this issue, Section 17 of the 2005 Act provides that the procedure and conduct of an inquiry are such as the Chairman may direct. This wide discretion is fettered only by the requirement that you act with fairness and with regard to the need to avoid unnecessary cost. As Chair of the Inquiry, you have the power to seek the undertaking sought from the Solicitor General and the Deputy Chief Constable. It will be for the Solicitor General and the Deputy Chief Constable to decide whether to grant the undertakings. Considering first the undertaking sought from the Solicitor General, you will be aware that undertakings have been sought and granted in other inquiries including the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry, the Bloody Sunday Inquiry, the Baha Musa Inquiry, the Grenfell Tower Inquiry and the Undercover Policing Inquiry. The applicable test when you are deciding whether to request undertakings from the Solicitor General involves balancing any positive effect on establishing the truth against any negative effect on the administration of justice. You will require to weigh in the balance the need to protect the right of witnesses not to incriminate themselves, the need of the inquiry to obtain as much relevant information as possible, and the public int interest in the administration of justice and upholding the rule of law. Dealing firstly with the positive effect on establishing the truth. Applying the test to the work of the inquiry requires you first to consider whether an undertaking from the Solicitor General would have a positive effect on establishing the truth. Absent an undertaking, some, perhaps all of the core participant officers and former officers, will exercise the privilege against self-incrimination and refuse to answer questions about the events of the 3rd of May 2015. <coughs> The nine police officers who attended the scene are key eyewitnesses to the incident in Hayfield Road. Three of the core participants are senior officers and are key witnesses to post-incident management in the aftermath of the incident. If they refuse to answer questions, the inquiry's ability to fulfil its terms of reference will be significantly impaired. Although the officers provided statements in 2015, those statements did not cover all of the issues relevant to the inquiry's terms of reference. The inquiry's terms of reference are broad and wider than the remit of the Police Independent Review Commissioner who noted the original statements. Discrepancies, inconsistencies and conflicts are apparent from a close reading of the officer's statements in relation to key issues of fact and they have not been explored. At the hearing in May, consideration will be given to whether the officer's actions 
complied with or departed from expected standards, training, guidance, standard operating procedures. Where their actions departed from those standards, explanations will be sought. Our terms of reference require you to establish the extent, if any, to which the events leading up to and following Mr Bio's death, in particular the actions of the officers involved, were affected by his actual or perceived race. As you are aware, at every stage, we will ask the question, would it have made a difference if Mr Bale had been white? In order for the inquiry to properly fulfil its terms of reference, it is essential that all these issues are explored in detail with the officers, both in statements taken in preparation for the hearing and in their oral evidence. It is essential that discrepancies, inconsistencies or conflicts are explored and resolved and that findings in fact are made on the basis of a careful consideration of the officer's evidence, alongside the evidence of civilian eyewitnesses and an assessment of their credibility and reliability. It is essential that the officers be given the opportunity to provide the inquiry with explanations for their actions. Securing explanations from the officers will allow you to consider the reasonableness and the adequacy of those explanations. Without an undertaking, an officer may feel inhibited from giving a frank explanation because of the risk of self-incrimination. In assessing the officer's credibility and reliability, and as with an eyewitness, you may wish to consider their body language and demeanour when giving evidence. If the officers refuse to answer questions, you will not have that opportunity. Assessment of credibility and reliability will be difficult if you do not see and hear the <coughs> officers give evidence. If the officers rely on the privilege against self-incrimination and refuse to answer questions, you will be left to make findings of fact and to draw inferences from those findings and to assess the officer's credibility and reliability, all on the basis of their original statements. This would be highly unsatisfactory and would thwart the inquiry's efforts to get to the truth. In short, without the officer's evidence, the inquiry will be significantly inhibited in fulfilling its terms of reference and its ability to determine the facts of what happened will be undermined. The reassurance of undertakings would allow the officers to give full and frank evidence without fear of the consequences of self-incrimination. It would allow discrepancies, inconsistencies or conflicts to be fully explored. It would allow explanations to be sought, put forward and assessed. That will all have a positive effect on establishing the truth. A core aspect of the inquiry will be to hold individual officers accountable for their own actions, both in relation to the events at Hayfield Road and subsequently. The task of the inquiry in carrying out that exercise will be enhanced if you have available to you the full and frank evidence of the officers and former officers. Conversely, without the undertakings, the evidence of the officers available may be limited to the statements given by them to PERC investigators with the limitations of those that I've identified. Without the undertakings, the ability of the inquiry to hold individuals to account for their actions would be significantly impeded. In addition, there would be wider benefits to the core participant officers and former officers giving evidence. The public and Mr Bio's family may wish to see all the officers who attended Hayfield Road and were involved in the restraint 
giving evidence under oath to this inquiry. There may be disappointment if the inquiry cannot secure their attendance and willing cooperation, both from the perspective of ensuring you have everything you need to make appropriate findings in fact, but also from the perspective of allowing the family and the wider public to hear evidence about the circumstances that led to Mr Bio's death. Turning to the negative effect on the administration of justice. The second part of the test requires you to consider any negative effect on the administration of justice. I recognise that Mr Bio's family and indeed the public may perceive that the undertaking sought would allow the officers to give evidence without fear of prosecution and that if new evidence emerges in the course of the inquiry, the Solicitor General would be unable to take that evidence into account in deciding whether to raise criminal proceedings. In responding to these two concerns, I would like to make two points. First, in reviewing their decision not to prosecute in light of any further evidence that emerges in the course of this inquiry, the Crown will be able to take into account any new evidence given by civilian eyewitnesses, other police witnesses or expert witnesses. And that may relate to the use of force or the cause of death, for example. And any relevant documentation that is gathered in and disclosed as part of the work of this inquiry. Second, the undertaking sought serve a limited purpose which does not amount to immunity from prosecution. And that distinction is an important one. The officers do not seek immunity from prosecution. The Crown could rely on new evidence given by officer B, C or D when assessing whether there is a sufficiency of evidence against Officer A. If the undertaking sought were granted by the Solicitor General, this means the Crown would not be able to rely on evidence given by Officer A in determining whether to bring proceedings against Officer A or in any future prosecution, but only against Officer A. I fully appreciate I have not yet heard the submissions of Ms Mitchell, but I foresee no negative effects on the administration of justice if the undertakings are sought. This inquiry presents the best opportunity to find out what happened on the day when Sheku Bayo died. As at today, no one has ever been prosecuted. No one has ever been found to be at fault. No evidence has ever been laid about the events of the 3rd of May 2015. The public and the family may have many unanswered questions. If the undertakings are not sought and the officers exercise the privilege against self-incrimination and refuse to answer questions, there is a real risk that the inquiry will be perceived to have failed to take all reasonable steps to secure important evidence. I am concerned that Mr Bio's relatives and family members, core participants and the general public will be left with unanswered questions and uncertainty and a feeling that they do not have closure on the matter. The perception may be one of disappointment and lingering <coughs> uncertainty. I appreciate that some may question my recommended course of action. It may not be perfect, but I would submit it is reasonable and would assist the inquiry in securing important evidence. The only opposition to you seeking the undertakings from the Solicitor General is from the relatives and family members of Mr Bayo. That alone is a highly significant factor in your decision making and you will shortly hear from Ms Mitchell. However, I would like to take this opportunity to reassure Mr Bio's family and relatives that I have given careful consideration 
to their written submissions and I have noted their concerns, but I remain satisfied that it is in the interests of the inquiry and indeed the public interest that the undertakings be sought and it is for that reason that I make this recommendation to you. Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights provides that everyone's right to life shall be protected by law and has been held by the European Court of Human Rights to impose a procedural obligation on the state to carry out an investigation following a death in state custody. That investigation must be independent, adequate and effective. The deceased's next of kin must be involved in the investigation to the extent necessary to safeguard their legitimate interests. An adequate investigation is one that is capable of leading to a determination of whether force used by the state was or was not justified and which identifies those responsible. Securing the full and frank evidence of the officers involved in Mr Bio's restraint will assist the inquiry in making that determination and comply with the obligations under Article 2. Without the reassurance of undertakings from the Solicitor General, it is likely that most, if not all, of the core participant officers and former officers will exercise the privilege against self-incrimination. If they do so, they will be entitled to refuse to answer questions about what happened on the 3rd of May 2015. I should stress that this would be their right and they could not be criticised for exercising that right. For the reasons I have set out, this would inhibit the inquiry's ability to fulfil the terms of reference. If, on the other hand, the undertakings are sought and ultimately granted, then you will have the power to compel the officers to give evidence and to answer questions about what happened on the 3rd of May 2015 they would not be able to rely on the privilege against self-incrimination. More evidence will be available to the Crown in the future if the undertakings are sought and granted than if they are not sought at all. It would be reasonable to assume that all of the officers will or may seek the reassurance of undertakings from the Solicitor General before they are willing to provide evidence to the inquiry. The Solicitor General has reserved her position, but she is bound to act fairly and in the public interest. She has indicated that she will consider any request made with an open mind. If you are minded to seek undertakings from the Solicitor General, it would be expedient to seek undertakings in relation to all of the core participant officers and former officers now. In all the circumstances, it is my recommendation that you not only seek undertakings from the Solicitor General on behalf of Constables Gibson and McDonough and Sergeant Maxwell, but as we are only three months from the hearing, I would recommend that all officers who may seek to rely on the privilege against self-incrimination be dealt with in a consistent way and that progress be made now rather than waiting until their positions are confirmed which may not be until they are giving evidence at the inquiry. If progress can be made now, it will avoid unnecessary delay at the hearing. I've intimated to all the core participants represented here today that I intend to make this recommendation and all have either positively confirmed that they are happy with the approach I'm recommending or they have raised no objection to that. The effect of the undertakings if granted will be that no evidence given to the inquiry by any officer will be used against them in any criminal proceedings in the future or will be used when deciding whether to bring such proceedings. Whether to grant the undertakings and the precise wording of the undertakings are, however, matters for the Solicitor General. If I might turn now to the undertakings sought from the Deputy Chief Constable. Of the 12 core participant officers and former officers, eight have indicated that they may seek or uh, that they seek or may seek undertakings from the Deputy Chief Constable 
in, ad in addition to the undertakings from the Solicitor General. As disciplinary proceedings cannot be raised against retired officers, Ms Short, Mr Payton and Mr McEwen have advised that they do not require undertakings from the Deputy Chief Constable. PC Walker has also indicated that he does not seek an undertaking. The undertaking sought by the remaining officers would be to the effect that no evidence given to the inquiry by any officer will be used against them in any misconduct investigation or proceedings <clears throat> or when deciding whether to bring such an investigation or proceedings. As I said earlier, the privilege against self-incrimination does not apply to disciplinary proceedings. However, many public inquiries have sought undertakings that the evidence given by witnesses to the inquiry will not be used against them in any disciplinary proceedings brought by their employer. As was observed by the chair of the undercover policing inquiry, witnesses are more likely to be frank and honest with their inquisitor if, they, if there will be no adverse consequences to them arising from their evidence. Such is the use of their evidence in a criminal prosecution or disciplinary proceedings against them. Similarly, in the Al Swedi inquiry, the chair noted that undertakings to protect witnesses from the risk of their evidence being used against them in disciplinary proceedings would properly serve to achieve the full and frank accounts from witnesses that the inquiry requires. Undertakings from employers were granted in the Hutton inquiry into the circumstances of the death of Dr David Kelly from the Secretary of the Cabinet to Permanent Secretaries in respect of civil servants assisting the inquiry. The Iraq inquiry, where both the government and the security services offered assurances against disciplinary proceedings to serve officials, serving officials and military pers personnel. The Rosemary Nelson inquiry, where undertakings were given by the Permanent Secretary to the Ministry of Defence, the Cabinet Secretary and Head of the Home Civil Service, the Head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service and the Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland. And the Baha Musa inquiry, where undertakings were given by the Permanent Under Secretary at the Ministry of Defence and from each of the Chiefs of Staff of the Armed Services. In deciding whether to seek undertakings from the Deputy Chief Constable, you must again weigh in the balance any positive effect on establishing the truth and any negative effect on the administration of justice. In my submission, the balance lies in favour of you seeking the undertaking sought. Undertakings from the Solicitor General alone will not protect the officers from the possibility of misconduct proceedings brought in response to their evidence to the inquiry. Even with the reassurance of undertakings from the Solicitor General, it may be that the officers who have indicated they will or may require undertakings from the Deputy Chief Constable will be re reluctant to engage fully and candidly with the inquiry without those undertakings. In order to secure the officer's full, frank and uninhibited accounts of the events of the 3rd of May 2015, it is my recommendation that you seek undertakings from the Deputy Chief Constable on behalf of the officers who have indicated they may require them. It should be noted that as with any undertakings granted by the Solicitor General, the undertaking sought from the Deputy Chief Constable would serve a limited purpose. They would prevent the use of officers a, Officer A's evidence to the inquiry in any future misconduct investigation of proceedings or in deciding whether to bring such an investigation or proceedings. However, evidence given by officers B, C or D may be used against Officer A in any investigation or proceedings or in deciding whether to bring the investigation or proceedings. 
Evidence given by civilian and expert witnesses to the inquiry may also be taken into account. Furthermore, as the Deputy Chief Constable has not before now considered whether to bring misconduct proceedings against any of the officers, she would also have available to her the officers' original statements, as well as the statements taken from eyewitnesses at the time, and as well as other documents disclosed as part of the work of the inquiry. The only evidence she would require to leave out of account in any misconduct investigation or proceedings against Officer E in deciding whether to bring such investigation or proceedings would be the evidence given by Officer E to the inquiry. Again, whether to grant the undertakings and the precise wording of the undertakings would be matters for the De Deputy Chief Constable. The only opposition to you seeking undertakings from the Deputy Chief Constable comes from the relatives and family members of Mr Bio. The comments I made earlier in the context of the undertaking sought from the Solicitor General, which I hope will have offered some reassurance to, the, to Mr Bio's family, apply equally here. You may find it helpful to hear from other counsel now. I, I would be very happy to respond to their submissions thereafter, if it's necessary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cobb. Oh. Well, Constable Daniel Gibson and Constable James McDonough. In enacting the Inquiries Act 2005, Parliament chose to respect and protect the fundamental right of any witness against self-incrimination. It did so in section 22. And in very many statutory inquiries of which this is one, that decision by Parliament sets a challenge for the inquiry panel. How best to seek the truth while not infringing fundamental rights. And that this would be a challenge for this particular inquiry is obvious from the terms of reference because part of the inquiry's work is to determine what happened on the 3rd of May 2015 in the encounter between Mr. Bio and the police and what the officers did or did not do in the immediate aftermath. This is not the first inquiry to have to address that challenge. There are innumerable examples many of which have been referenced in the written submissions lodged by core participants and indeed in the written submissions I lodged on behalf of those I represent, which I adopt here. The most common method of meeting that challenge is for the chair of the inquiry to seek undertakings. And in every instance, it is for the chair to seek the undertakings. It is not for an individual witness or core participant to approach the Solicitor General or the Deputy Chief Constable. It is a matter for the Chair. Because as Ms Graham has said in terms of Section 17 of the Act, it is entirely for the Chair to determine how best to conduct the inquiry, bearing in mind its aims and its terms of reference. It's perhaps therefore a little unfortunate that this process of submissions and a hearing on the question of undertakings had to be initiated by me on behalf of the core participants whom I represent, rather than being initiated ex proprio motu by the inquiry team. And the reason it is raised by me at this stage is the happenstance of timing that those whom I represent were sent a letter asking for a statement. As I understand it, the intention of the inquiry team is to take statements from all officers who attended the scene that day. It's also perhaps a little unfortunate that it fell to me to raise the matter in light of the submission just made by senior counsel to the inquiry, because she is the person responsible for the investigation and the presentation of evidence to the inquiry, and she submits that undertakings should be sought from the Solicitor General and the Deputy Chief Constable. 
I think, um, Mr. Corbett, in the other inquiries, certainly the ones that I've looked at, the matter tends to have been raised by a core participant. There are, um, Chair, quite a number where it is raised by the inquiry panel itself. One example has been given by Ms. Graham, which is the undercover policing inquiry, where counsel to the inquiry produced a very lengthy submission to the Chair on which contributions were invited from various core participants. Uh, be that uh, uh, as it may, there is a risk, I agree with Ms. Graham here, there is a risk of misconception as to what is being sought here. In their um, second submission uh, on this issue, the legal representatives of the bio family uh, framed uh, the application made by Maxwell, Gibson and McDonough as officers demanding some form of some convoluted form of immunity. And the submission, um, in my respectful view, misunderstands three things. That is that any request for undertakings is to be made by you, Chair, on the basis that you decide it will facilitate the best interests of the inquiry. I'll come to the test in a moment. Secondly, there is no suggestion that an undertaking grants any sort of immunity to any officer. What is being sought is, as Ms Graham says, very limited. Simply that any evidence given by the officer will not be founded upon in relation to proceedings or a decision to bring proceedings in respect of that officer himself. It should be clear that the undertakings will not prevent any officer being prosecuted or disciplined based on other evidence that may emerge in the course of this inquiry, including from their colleagues. And the third matter is that the provision of undertakings as a matter of fact and as a matter of law will facilitate what it is that the family in their written submission have said that they want namely that you chair use all your legal powers to find and get to the truth of how Sheku Bio died. Can I perhaps then cover four things in my submission? Uh, the first is the scope of the right against self-incrimination. The second is the test which the chair should apply in deciding whether to seek undertakings because to some extent I disagree with senior counsel to the inquiry about that test. Then I'll come to look at the reasons why an, an undertaking should be sought from the Solicitor General, and then the reasons why an undertaking should be sought from the Deputy Chief Constable. So just dealing first then with the scope of the right against self-incrimination. Uh, and in order to be effective in my submission, any undertaking sought should be coextensive with the scope of the right against self-incrimination. In other words, it should cover the same scope, the same range. And the right against self-incrimination has a broad scope, which Ms. Graham has already said something about. It is not confined solely to providing answers or evidence which may constitute an admission or may directly implicate a witness in the commission of a crime. Uh, in fact, in the present case, insofar as the officers I represent are concerned, that is not a likely scenario. But the right extends to evidence which may indirectly implicate the witness or which may form links in a chain of circumstantial evidence. Uh, and of course, uh, as you well understand, Chair, a piece of circumstantial evidence can have more than one interpretation. It also, in my submission, extends to evidence which may inform the case which the prosecution may wish to establish and or evidence which they may wish to rely on in deciding whether to prosecute. I provided to you ahead of today a number of authorities. I don't propose, unless you wish me to do so, to take you to the detail of those. But in the rank film distributors case, 
it is clear that the right extends to use of an answer which may set in train a line of inquiry. We see that at 443D of that case. In the Den Norske Bank case, it is also clear that the right extends to using material in deciding whether or not to prosecute, not simply in the course of a case in court. That's at 289A of that judgment. Ms Graham referred to uh, Article 6 of the European Convention as also enshrining the right against self-incrimination, and I agree with that. While, of course, Article 6 is not engaged in relation to an officer providing evidence to this inquiry, there is no discernible difference in the content of the right under Article 6 as under domestic law. And I lodged in advance a copy of the case of Saunders against the United Kingdom. Again, I don't intend to take you to it in any detail. But at paragraph 71, the European Court of Human Rights made clear the scope of the right and that it extended beyond directly incriminating answers or admissions, where they said, bearing in mind the concept of fairness in Article 6, the right not to incriminate oneself cannot reasonably be confined to statements of admission or wrongdoing or remarks which are directly incriminating. Testimony obtained under compulsion which appears on its face to be of a non-incriminating nature, such as exculpatory remarks or mere information on questions of fact, may later be deployed in criminal proceedings in support of a prosecution case. So a witness, any witness, is able to invoke the right against self-incrimination, not just in respect of directly incriminating answers, but in respect of evidence which might subsequently be used to his detriment in the course of later criminal proceedings or a decision to raise those proceedings. So it follows that unless the prohibition on the use of such evidence by the prosecuting authority is absolute in terms of the undertaking, the scope of a witness's right not to answer the questions or produce documents will be very wide indeed. Can I turn then to the test to be applied? I agree with senior counsel to the inquiry that section 17 of the act gives you the power to seek undertaking subject to the caveat of fairness. Ms Graham suggests that the test involves consideration of any positive effect of establishing the truth balanced against any negative effect on the administration of justice. And she went on to elaborate on that by weighing in the balance the need to protect the rights of witnesses, the need of the inquiry to obtain as much relevant information as possible, and the public interest in the administration of justice and the upholding of the rule of law. I respectfully disagree that that is the test. In my submission, the test for the chair is only to decide how best the inquiry can perform its duty in fulfilling its aims and its terms of reference while protecting the fundamental rights of witnesses. What that means in practice is that in deciding whether to seek undertakings, you should be considering whether in the absence of such undertakings, the work of the inquiry will be hampered. While she didn't refer to the source, I understand that senior counsel to the inquiry draws that test from a ruling in the Manchester Arena inquiry, where that test was set out by reference to something that was said by the chair of the undercover policing inquiry. In my submission, the chair in the Manchester Arena Inquiry inaccurately stated the origin of that test. Because when one examines the undercover policing inquiry ruling, the only reference to that test is in the submission of counsel to the inquiry. And the only context in which that submission was made and reference made to it by the chair of the undercover policing inquiry 
was in the context of an application for what I might describe as an extended undertaking. In other words, not an undertaking of the sort that is sought here, but rather an undertaking that the evidence of one witness could not be used against another witness or a third party. So in that context, it was clearly important to conduct some sort of balancing exercise. Because in that context, of course, what the inquiry required to consider was the public interest and the effect on it in the inability to prosecute third parties rather than in relation to the witness themselves. And it was noted in the undercover policing inquiry, and can I say the undertaking was never sought, that the breadth of it was striking, and it was noted that it would be wide enough to permit a witness in the inquiry to identify a murderer, and that murderer to be unable to be brought to justice. So that is the very particular context of that test. And it was adopted in the Manchester Arena inquiry in my submission without noticing its proper origin. Other inquiries that we have reviewed, and many of them are mentioned in our written submission, when considering undertakings restricted to being coextensive with the privilege against self-incrimination, have taken a different approach, leaving the question of the public interest to the prosecuting authorities to consider in deciding whether or not to grant the undertaking. If I am wrong about the test and senior counsel to the inquiry is right, then I agree with her that the negative effect here is minimal, not least because the Crown has already decided and reviewed its decision not to prosecute, having conducted a fulsome investigation, including having an account from each of the officers available to it. In my submission, as I say, the test which you should apply is simply whether the work of the inquiry will be hampered. The other aspect of the public interest in prosecution in other inquiries has been left expressly to the prosecuting authorities. One example of that is the Grenfell Tower inquiry. Uh, and again, I lodged this ruling with you in advance. But at paragraph 24 of his ruling, the chair said, it is for the attorney general, of course, to decide whether it would be appropriate for him to give an undertaking, and if so, in what terms. It will be for him to balance the competing demands of the inquiry against the need to avoid prejudicing any future criminal proceedings. Both engage the public interest, but in different ways. And in Grenfell, the test which was ultimately applied, it was at paragraph 14, was whether an undertaking is necessary to enable the inquiry to carry out its work and fulfill its terms of reference. Similarly, in the Bloody Sunday inquiry, the issue of self-incrimination and undertakings is dealt with in their report from page 65. And at page 71, it is clear that the test that was applied was whether in absence of an assurance, we are likely to be hampered in carrying out our task of trying to find out what happened. That is the test I urge you to apply here. Can I turn then to the third part of my submission, reasons to obtain an undertaking from the Solicitor General? As we've already heard, the scope of the right against self-incrimination is a broad one. And the terms of reference here are broad and cover not only the events at the scene of Mr. Bio's encounter with the police, but also, insofar as my clients are concerned, subsequent events at the police office and during the investigation. And while it is the position of those whom I represent that no crimes have been committed by them, the inquiry will be looking into the circumstances 
in which allegations of various types of potentially criminal conduct may be levelled against them. These may obviously fall within the scope of the right against self-incrimination. For example, looking at what happened in the encounter in the street with Mr Bio. The potential criminal allegations are, in my submission, obvious. But leaving aside those most obvious of possibilities, there are a number of other areas into which this inquiry will conduct an investigation and hear evidence in which the right against self-incrimination would also apply. For example, matters that might fall within Section 22 of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012, that is the offence of neglect or violation of duty. And that statutory offence has a broad sweep and is apt to cover a great many topics in relation to which this inquiry will want to ask questions of the officers. I note already, for example, that you have asked for position statements from the Chief Constable and the Police Federation about officers' obligations in terms of completing various forms and so on. Because of that broad sweep, in my submission it can be concluded that the inquiry is likely to be hampered in fulfilling its terms of reference if no undertaking is obtained from the Solicitor General. The question then is what is the effect of seeking and obtaining an undertaking? In a letter to the core participants of the 21st of January, the inquiry team asked legal representatives of police officers other than those whom I represent whether if undertakings were obtained they would waive their privilege. That in my respectful submission is to misunderstand the nature of an undertaking because if an undertaking is sought and given from the Solicitor General, the right against self-incrimination is not engaged and cannot be relied upon. It's not a question of waiver. The officers will be compelable to answer the questions that they are asked. That is why I said at the outset that the provision of undertakings is the means to achieve the aim that the inquiry find and get to the truth of how Sheku Bio died. That is in everyone's interest, including those whom I represent. Miss Mitchell, on behalf of the family, may say that the officers owe a duty of candour to the inquiry, subject to their right against self-incrimination, and I agree with that. And those whom I represent have already stated to the inquiry in writing that they acknowledge that duty. But without the undertaking, inquiry hearings risk being derailed by the invocation of the right, which as we've seen has a broad scope here. Or as senior counsel to the inquiry has just put it, the, the inquiry may be thwarted in its efforts. So to in, or in order to ensure that the inquiry can fulfil its aims, in my submission, an undertaking should be sought from the Solicitor General in the terms which we propose. Can I turn then to the reasons to seek an undertaking from the Deputy Chief Constable? I of course agree that the right against self-incrimination does not extend to disciplinary matters. Yet undertakings in relation to the use of evidence provided by a witness in subsequent disciplinary proceedings are not uncommon in, inqui in inquiries such as this. So what is the rationale, Chair, for you to seek them? Uh, in my submission, it is the same. Will the provision of the undertaking assist the inquiry in fulfilling its aim and getting to the truth? And the reason disciplinary undertakings uh, are sought is that they provide witnesses with a comfort that encourages full and frank testimony. Other inquiries have recognised a potential chilling effect on witnesses if they may be exposed to disciplinary proceedings as a result of what they say, particularly where those disciplinary proceedings can significantly impact their professional life by way of dismissal and so on. That is the position here. 
as it has been put in other inquiries, while there may be an expectation of cooperation, it is nonetheless recognised that an undertaking from the disciplinary authority has value, even where it may be part of the professional duty of the witness to provide full and frank testimony, for example, in the case of a soldier, for example, here in the case of a police officer. I provided to you in advance a number of undertakings that have been given in previous inquiries. And the reason I've done so is that they set out the rationale behind giving them. So in the Hutton inquiry, as Ms. Graham has already referred to, the Cabinet Secretary provided an undertaking in relation to the civil servants. And he began by saying, the government expects witnesses to cooperate fully with the inquiry and to give full and frank testimony. To help witnesses to do so, the government therefore gives the following undertaking. In other words, a recognition of the expectation, but a recognition that the undertaking provides assistance in fulfilling that expectation. And a senior counsel to the inquiry has said in the Rosemary Nelson inquiry, such undertakings were obtained from the head of the civil service in the UK and Northern Ireland, from the Ministry of Defence and from the Chief Constable of the PSNI. And in each of them, they acknowledged either an expectation or a duty in the case of the police and the military to cooperate fully, but that the undertaking would encourage full and frank testimony from those witnesses. It's now conceded by the Deputy Chief Constable that an undertaking would be competent. Again, in my submission, it's for the Deputy Chief Constable to weigh in the balance the need for an undertaking to assist the inquiry with the need to maintain public confidence in the police by holding officers to account for any wrongdoing. It is also for the Deputy Chief Constable to determine the scope of any undertaking which she may give. Previous inquiries demonstrate that there are a variety of approaches. In my submission, you chair should seek a broad undertaking as proposed in our draft and leave the matter to the Deputy Chief Constable to decide whether to grant it, whether it should be in those terms or whether it should be in narrower terms. And again, can I emphasize as Ms. Graham does, that an undertaking does not preclude disciplinary proceedings against any officer based on evidence that may emerge from this inquiry from another source. And it does not therefore ask the Deputy Chief Constable to abrogate her responsibility for good conduct. So with those submissions, I invite you Chair to seek the inquiry, uh, to seek the undertakings from the Solicitor General and the Deputy Chief Constable in the terms which we have proposed in our written submission. Thank you, uh, Ms. McCall. Uh, Ms. Mitchell. Uh, yes, for the purposes of the recording, we've been asked to um, identify ourselves once again. I'm Claire Mitchell, Senior Counsel for the family of Sheikh Abayo. On the issue of principle, namely whether any undertakings of any kind be granted, the family of Sheikh Abayo oppose the request for an undertaking from both the Solicitor General for Scotland and the Deputy Chief Constable from those seeking them. The family of Sheikh Abayo have waited now some seven years to hear the truth of what happened and want the inquiry to use its power to establish the truth. Whether the legal test is as already set out by counsel to the inquiry or whether the test is, as Ms McCall has identified, <coughs> put short whether the work of the inquiry would be hampered if undertakings were not granted, it is submitted that in the application of either test, the balance can and should be struck in not granting those undertakings. As everyone understands, those seeking undertakings are all police officers. The duties of police officers are to be found in the declaration that each officer makes in taking up office, and that's now to be found in the 2012 Act, in Police Scotland's Code of Ethics, 
and in statutory standards of professional behaviour. In the recent independent review on policing, complaints handling, investigation and misconduct issues, which was published in November 2020, it stated that these aforementioned duties, quote, all of which to some extent express or imply a statutory, ethical or procedural duty on that person to assist in the investigation of a serious incident and to uphold convention rights. In the aforementioned report, it is also clear, as is accepted by uh, Ms McCall, that the duty of candour exists on police officers. But in that report, it was considered that that duty may not have been sufficiently clearly set out. I don't intend to take the chair to it, but that's uh, recorded at paragraph 7, 108. Thus, a recommendation was made that the duty of candour be, uh, be put beyond any doubt by statute. And whilst this recommendation has not yet been implemented, the duty nonetheless exists. Reference is further made uh, to paragraph 107.8, wherein it states, quote, I have considered whether the current position is sufficiently clear to police officers and to the public who have a legitimate expectation that police officers will give every assistance after a serious incident. That assumption of cooperation should be put beyond doubt in primary legislation, including the wording of the constable's declaration. On the issue of convention rights, the report suggests that there's an argument to be made that a duty of candour, quotes, is an obligation under Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which requires parties to positively assist the state in conducting a thorough and effective investigations, unquote. Part of the purpose of the duty on the state to investigate is to ensure the accountability of those who work for the state, which of course includes police officers. The duty under Article 2 requires cooperation in good faith by individual officers and failures to do so may give rise to a breach of Article 2. It is submitted that the review is correct when at paragraph 711 it states those in the office of constable and holding the powers of that office have a higher duty than others to account for their actions and record what they did or saw in the execution of their duties. The family of Sheikh Abayo have a legitimate expectation that police officers will give every assistance after a serious incident and that expectation extends to coming to a public inquiry and answering all and any legitimate and relevant questions put to it by the inquiry. On the issue of whether the Chair has power to seek undertakings from the Solicitor General and Deputy Chief Constable, it appears not to be an issue, but for the avoidance of doubt, no submissions are made on behalf of the family in that regard. Picking up uh, on a small point made uh, by uh, Council to the Inquiry, the Council to the Inquiry indicated that transcripts would be admissible in any criminal proceedings. And I simply remind uh, the Chair that it's only in certain circumstances as identified in the Criminal Procedure Act 1995 uh, uh, that statements are used in that way, that being prior inconsistent statements for the purposes of the adoption, uh, sorry, prior inconsistent statements and those statements which are adopted by a witness. But, but a statement made by an officer could be in the evidence in the, in the inquiry could be used in a subsequent criminal trial of that officer if it was against interest. Oh, yeah, yes, indeed. I'm just reminding the inquiry in the circumstances in which it could be used being put to that witness. And there are two circumstances in which that would happen. They're not simply admissible as course as part of the evidence uh, which would be included in a case. The chair has uh, the issue of principle um, and the position of the family of Sheikh Abai on this. 
namely that they oppose the request from undertakings from uh, the Crown and the Deputy Chief Constable, and I have no further submissions to make. Thank you, Ms Mitchell. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, uh, Dean of Faculty. Uh, already, uh, I am instructed in this matter on behalf of the Scottish Police Federation and also uh, Officer Short and Walker, although today I'm, I'm really representing the interests of the Federation uh, only, uh, and, and really my appearance today is, is prompted by the opposition uh, made on behalf of the family. The, the depth of feeling in this matter is clear and understood and understandable, but my Lord, I cannot let pass without comment the criticisms that are made of the officers and indeed of the Federation regarding the request that your Lordship uh, should seek these undertakings. In the written submissions, that uh, request is described as astonishing, as shameful and as insulting. Uh, those descriptions, my Lord, in my submission are wholly unwarranted. A request for undertakings in a, an inquiry such as this is commonplace, no respectable sensible lawyer would recommend proceeding without at the very least exploring the availability of undertakings on behalf of his or her client. There is nothing shameful, it is sensible and it is lawful, in particular against a backdrop where there is an ongoing campaign on social media describing uh, uh, matters in a way that suggest uh, criminality on the part of certain individuals. So, my Lord, in, in those um, uh, circumstances, the uh, Federation uh, resists any suggestion of any wrongdoing, shamefulness or insulting behaviour in the seeking of these undertakings uh, and supports the seeking of those undertakings. My Lord, as to the, the test, in my submission there is a cigarette paper between the test suggested by counsel to the inquiry and the test suggested by my learning friend Ms McCall. In my submission, perhaps the most guiding uh, aspect of this is the need to establish the truth uh, and the reasons that have been so eloquently set out by counsel to the inquiry as to why the establishing of the truth would be facilitated by the request of these undertakings is, in my respectful submission, the dominant consideration in this matter. And if one needs an example of that, one need only hark back to the inquiry into the bin lorry disaster to see how that inquiry was thwarted and impaired by the fact that Mr Clark required to stand up and say no comment to all the questions that were asked uh, of him. Uh, my Lord, in these circumstances, uh, I simply wished to uh, advocate the position there is nothing wrong in these undertakings. On the contrary, it is sensible. Uh, and in my submission, uh, the undertakings should be sought uh, from both the Solicitor General and the Chief, Chief Constable in the manner proposed by Council to the Inquiry. Thank Otherwise, you, Dean of Faculty. Mr Jackson. Thank you, my Lord. I represent Officers Good, Smith and Tomlinson. Having listened to the submissions, I am tempted to say nothing because it has all been really covered, uh, I agree the distinction between the test being suggested uh, is perhaps not a great one. But I want to say one thing in particular. I do find Miss Mitchell's position somewhat ironic, if I may use that word. The family wish to have the truth in every possible way that it can be explored. Yet, what the submission of Miss Mitchell amounts to is to say to you as the chair, do not seek the undertakings. In the knowledge, it must be in the knowledge that that will force officers to rely on the provision of the right against self-incrimination because, as has been explained, that is a very wide right, and no responsible lawyer would do otherwise in the circumstances of no undertaking than to give that advice to their clients. But behind that, and I do find this somewhat disturbing, 
Behind that position is underlying the suggestion, which has been stated publicly, that those who rely on that right have somehow got something to hide, that they are abusing the process, they are hiding behind the right which they have. And that, frankly, should stop being said, because in my submission, it is wrong. Counsel for the inquiry in dealing with that, and I think I quote, Sill says that those who do rely on such a right cannot be criticised for the exercise of that right. That is undoubtedly a correct legal statement. And I can only hope that those who represent the family will take that on board. But it remains my position, along with others, that it's not a right that we should be forced into, because that is what it would happen, but that in a way for the reasons that have been given very clearly by others, you should accede to the request to seek the undertakings from both the Solicitor General and the Chief Constable. Thank you, Mr Jackson. Now, do any other legal representatives wish to address me, because this would be the opportunity to do so. I don't think anybody has indicated that they wish to do so. Um, accordingly, Miss Graham, do you want to say something further? Yes, thank you. I'd like to make two further comments. First of all, in relation to the comments made by Miss McCall, that, uh, as she said, it was unfortunate that she had to raise the matter. Uh, on behalf of her clients. And I would like to make some comments about the timing of this hearing, uh, which has been very carefully selected for different reasons. This matter of undertakings and the privilege has been raised uh, by a number of core participants, with a number of core participants, uh, last year. Uh, it was raised, in fact, at the first meeting that I had with Ms McCall and with other core participants. So it's something that we've been planning for a significant period of time. At the preliminary hearing on the 18th of November last year, I explained about the many thousands of documents which had been gathered in. And those documents are large in number and it was vital, in my view, that they be carefully considered and analysed. And as a result of that work, a chronology has been prepared and circulated amongst all the core participants, along with issues which have been identified. That careful consideration and analysis allowed us to identify discrepancies, inconsistencies and apparent conflicts, which I've mentioned. We wished to do that and carry out that task prior to taking statements. And that was in order that the task of taking witness statements would address key issues which are in dispute or where there's contradictions amongst witnesses. It also allowed us to give fair notice to the witnesses and the officers as to what the position was. And even today, only three out of the 12 officers who could rely on the privilege have reached a stage where they are in a position to make formal applications, and that is the three officers whom Ms McCall represents. Even today, nine out of the 12 officers do not yet consider it possible for various reasons to put formal applications before you, albeit I am recommending to you that you deal with all consistently and in a uniform manner. Letters seeking witness statements were, as I said in my submission, issued to officers on the 29th of November and the 9th of December. And they were designed effectively to flush out this issue and provide an appropriate moment and opportunity to address you on it. It is open to you today to simply deal with the three applications before you, but I have urged you not to do this. But I would wholly reject any criticism that this should have been done earlier and that in some way now is not the appropriate time. It is quite appropriate for the matter to be raised when statements are being sought 
and not before. Before statements were sought, and before today, officers simply did not have the chronology or the issues identified to them. The second point that I'd like to make relates to the test. The Manchester Arena inquiry ruling on the application for the Attorney General to give an undertaking by Sir John Saunders was on the 10th of June last year. Paragraph 6 of that ruling makes it clear the test that he has carried out, Sir John Saunders, in deciding whether to make uh, a request to the Attorney General. And that test, and I quote, is any positive effect on establishing the truth falls to be balanced against any negative effect on the administration of justice. No one disputed that that was an accurate summary of the appropriate test. And in fact, that is the test that was used by Sir John in his ruling last year. Whether Sir John made an error as to the underlying source, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to comment on that this morning. The argument made by Ms McCall was not foreshadowed in her written submission or in any communication between Council, so unfortunately I have not had the opportunity to consider it in any detail. But my submission to you is that it makes absolutely no difference to the task that you have before you today. And to use the expression used by the Dean of Faculty, there is a cigarette paper between the test which I proposed and what Ms McCall said in submission. I would simply reiterate that the material factors which I have suggested are relevant and important to your decision have been raised. I maintain my submission in that and uh, have nothing further to add. Thank you, Ms Graham. Uh, well, I'm grateful to Council for their submissions. Um, I shall uh, issue a decision as soon as I can and the inquiry will now adjourn.